potential. What is it, and how do you know when you've reached it? You know, it's something we all have. It's those qualities or abilities that if you develop it, it can lead to success. And if you can tap into certain levels of your potential, it can lead to success and fulfillment in things that are meaningful to you. See, I had learned this from my father. He was a farmer. He taught us to be successful on a small farm, that it was reliant on our ability to create a crop that could reach its full potential. See, he taught us a lesson. It was not to focus on the crop itself. It was to focus on its foundation. He said to feed the soil and not the plant. Because it's the soil is the foundation for the plant to allow for the roots to grow. It's the soil that provides the nutrients for the plant to thrive. And if you didn't take care or nurture or cultivate the soil, the soil would eventually lose its nutrients, it would de become degraded, it would dry up and turn to dust. And therefore, the crop would also wither and die. See, he taught me a lot of lessons, but we didn't necessarily grow up in Montana. I, I, I started out growing up in, in Los Angeles. Uh, we didn't move to Montana until I was 10 with my older brother and my mom after she had remarried. We relocated to a, a small town, a, a rural community called Geraldine, and it was right about where that little cowboy in the middle is. It was known for its agriculture, its rolling hills, its cattle ranches, and the occasional UFO sighting. <laughs> you know, the town itself was small. It had a population of 300 people. I had a high school of 50 students. I had a graduating class of 10 students, and it was the same 10 students that I had since I was in fifth grade. But I like to gauge how big your school is by how many times you went to your prom. You see, in a small town, it was almost imperative that the entire high school participate. Otherwise, you just simply wouldn't have enough people to have a dance. I participated three times. <laughs> and what I would do to get that hair back. But this was the backdrop where I learned a lot of my life lessons. See, I learned these from my father. He taught us, you can't have success without hard work and passion. He was the gentleman in the middle. I'm the little guy on the left, and that's my older brother on the right. See, he, he taught us how to work hard. He, he led by example. He was always the first one to wake up in the morning, to tend to the farm, and sometimes he wouldn't come home until the sun went down. And he expected my brother and myself to follow suit. So we had a daily ritual after school. We would expect a chore list waiting for us on the kitchen table. And it was a chore list that he expected us to do before we could come home that evening. And it was typical farm-like chores. It was like milk the cow or get the eggs. Sometimes it was shovel the barn. But the one thing that my brother and I hated more than anything, and that was pick rocks. And it was a task that sounds about as laborious and menial as it sounds. What it, what it entailed, it was um, me and my brother, and we had this old rusty tractor with a bucket on the front. And we'd have to go out in the field and pick up large rocks and put them inside the bucket. And see, but I barely weighed 100 pounds soaking wet at the time, so I didn't even have the strength or the weight to push the clutch down on this tractor. So my brother normally drove the tractor, and I was the one doing the labor. And sometimes the rocks were so big that we'd have to take a chain and we'd have to wrap it around the rock and use a tractor to pull it out of the ground. You see, farming was a passion for my father. It wasn't my passion. And so this was work that I didn't really enjoy. It didn't motivate me. But fortunately for me, growing up in a small town, it evolved around two things. One was farming and the other was high school sports. You see, in a small town, the community came together on weekends to support the team, but it was also uh, an effort to get caught up with the, the locals and share knowledge. And our father gave us the ability to make a decision if, if we wanted to participate in sports. 
And so I jumped at it because I saw it as an opportunity to get out of doing those chores. And this is where I found my first passion, and it was basketball. See, I didn't necessarily have any skills. I definitely didn't have any of the physical attributes. I was always oftentimes the smallest kid. But I did have one thing. I had a hard work ethic. And after practice, I would normally stay later and I would work on my fundamentals. I'd work on my dribbling skills. I'd work on my shooting. And I'd work on my free throws. And I would do it over and over and over again. I started to see some levels of progress. I started to see some success. And I started to get a little bit better. And I started to see the fruits of my labor when I was a sophomore in high school. I made the starting varsity point guard position. And that, that gave me courage, knowing that the formula of hard work and passion can get you somewhere. And this guided, through, guided me through much of my life and through my adulthood. After school, I went to college and I studied my other passion, which was design and art. And I got my dream job, and I got promoted to become creative director, and I thought I was doing everything right. It gave me the courage to do my ultimate dream, which was start my own business. So I quit my job, and I converted uh, the spare bedroom in my apartment into my office. And I started getting my own clients, and I started doing work in graphic design. And it was an exciting time. It was scary, but it was really exciting. Doing work that I was excited about, and clients that I really wanted to work with. But something started to happen. He said, now I'm like in my mid-30s, and I started to see a certain level, it was like a plateau that I hit, and I started to see diminishing returns on my efforts. And, and this challenged me to my core because everything that I believed in up to that point seemed false. It didn't make sense to me. You know, it was, it was a time in my life I expected sustainability and, and comfort, but I didn't have a certain level of confidence in my career. I didn't have my finances in order, and I wasn't really strong in my relationship. So I knew I needed to change something. I knew that I had more potential in me, but I didn't know how to develop it. And it reminded me of that story our father would tell us about, feed the soil, not the plant. And I started to realize that I had put so much focus on myself that I had lost sight of my foundation and what was important to me. And I needed to change that, but I didn't know how. So I started researching and I fortunately was able to find this, this study. It was a five-year study on the habits of the rich and the poor. And what they uncovered was there was a common baseline between the two. There was two different levels of happiness. There was a short-term happiness, and there was a long-term happiness. See, short-term happiness is a result of instant gratification. And it's something that we all experience. You probably experienced it today. It's, it's that feeling you get when you get like that text message, or you get a bunch of likes on your Instagram page. Or when you go shopping and you buy the new pair of shoes, it's, it's that feeling that you get. But really what that is, it's, it's called pleasure. It's not happiness. And what's happening is your brain is releasing a chemical called dopamine. And it's the same sort of chemical that is released when you're drinking or smoking or gambling. So you can imagine that this is highly, highly addictive. And this is why many people subscribe to short-term happiness. But the problem is it's fleeting. And it's just pleasure. It's not happiness. Whereas long-term happiness is the result of pursuing fulfillment. And this is only achieved in the pursuit of fulfillment. So I learned about happiness and I wanted to learn more. I wanted to know how I can produce it and how I can make it a constant in my life. So to create long-term happiness, there was, there was four of actions you could do. And they are perceived control, perceived progress, doing something as a team or a group. And the last one is doing something greater than yourself. The first one is perceived control. It's when you feel like you are able to have an input in the outcome with words or actions. 
An example is a good friend of mine had, he said he was having a hard time getting his kid to eat, to eat his vegetables. He would say, Otto, I want you to eat your broccoli. And Otto would look at him and he'd say, no. And so he changed his tactic and he said, Otto, do you want to eat broccoli or do you want to eat spinach? And he's like, I want to eat broccoli. He had a perceived control of the situation. The other thing is perceived progress. And I think a lot of us have this challenge. You know, when we set goals, we see the goal at the summit of the hill, and we see where we're standing right now, but what we don't know is we don't see anything in between because we don't know how to manage progress to see incremental steps to get to our goal. The third thing is do something with the team. You know, as humans, we're, we're social creatures, and we crave strong social bonds. So when you do these things with groups, you, you're... What you're doing is you're, you're sharing ideas and knowledge and, and you're challenging each other and making each other better. Think like a, a running club, for example. Running clubs are successful because um, you do them together and, and studies show that people are more likely to give up on themselves than to give up on others. And the last thing is do something greater than yourself. And you know, this is something where we get, we get comfortable with who we are and where we are. We get complacent. But I encourage you to get uncomfortable because it's your mind and your body will change through adversity. And you'll get stronger. You need to reach for something outside of your reach. And so when I heard this, I realized what I was doing wrong is I, I put so much focus on hard work and passion and myself, and I wasn't focusing on that foundation that I needed to live and grow my life off of. And it was happiness. And then looking back at it, it's something that I had when I was a kid. See, I, I worked hard with a passion that I had, but I couldn't put my finger on that, that other sort of intangible thing. You know, but it was there the entire time. It was happiness. And so this was my eureka moment. I'm like, I, I have to implement this in my life. I needed a change for myself and for my business. So what I did is uh, I needed a change, but I realized I was in a, I was a plant in a small pot. And the first thing I needed to do is I needed to get a larger pot to allow my roots to grow, and allow me to thrive and blossom. So the first thing I did is I moved my office out of my um, be spare bedroom and I moved it into my garage. It was little baby steps, but I had about twice the amount of space and I was able to put a couple more computers in there. I hired an intern and I paid him $10 an hour and I fed him lunch every day. And sometimes I was, I honestly didn't know if I was going to be able to pay for his salary. But we persevered and we started to see things happening. You know, I started to feel something I haven't felt in a long time is, and it was that, that fire in my belly and it's because I was sharing information and knowledge with him. And then I could see the look in his eyes because he was learning something from me. And we started to see progress. We started getting more clients. And then I had to hire another designer. And we saw more progress. So what did I have to do next is that pot got too small, so I needed to get a larger pot. And so I, I, I got a studio space in Pasadena. And then I focused on hiring people that were like-minded, who had similar goals who were passionate about their craft, and who wanted to inspire others and learn from others and challenge each other. And the key is collaborating. And so in finding these people, I was very blessed to, to, to know that they were actually teaching me things and were learning off of each other. And it was my job to create a foundation or a culture of happiness and empowering them to make their decisions. And in doing this, we started to see results. We started producing work that was better than we had expected. We started getting clients that were bigger than what I expected as well. And we motivated each other. And we started to see more of our potential as a business, as an individual. And I started to see potential in all my employees. And it, and it fueled us to keep moving forward. So now I'm here today, and I'm, I, I can honestly say I'm probably the happiest I've ever been in my life. I met my wife, who I just remarried, or I just married. <laughs> married, first marriage. 
You know, I find that I'm working less. I'm making more. Doing great work. And I'm doing it with people that inspire me. And it gets me out of bed every morning. And it's by doing something to reach our full potential that allowed this to happen. Looking at long-term goals and not those short-term goals. And doing it with passion. So I encourage everyone here to find your passion. And then when you find that passion, never let it go. Hang on to it and put all of your energy into it. And then when you do this, you, you have to do it with purpose. You have to do something that is fulfilling to you. But I have to remind you, when you're trying to find your potential, when you're trying to move your mountains, you can't do it unless you pick up one rock at a time. Thank you.